Is proposal one the right fix for our roads? City Council President asked for more money, a new state superintendent, and Madonna versus Rochester Hills. Stay put, my week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaroundplan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there and welcome to my week. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Christy McDonald. Spring officially arrives tomorrow. We've already had a taste of the warm weather, but spring in Michigan can only mean one thing. Potholes. The roads, they're a mess. As the snow melts away, the potholes are opening up and making driving dangerous and really annoying. Coming up, will voters pass a complicated plan to fix Michigan's roads? We'll take a look at the pros and cons of Proposal 1. Plus, at least one Detroit City Council member wants a pay increase. Is it justified or just poor timing? Also, the State Board of Education selects a new leader for Michigan schools. And the mayor of Rochester Hills takes on Madonna. It is all coming up for you on my week. But we do start with Proposal 1. It's being described as a complicated solution to a long-standing problem. If approved, the plan will raise the state sales tax to 7%. It would eliminate the state sales tax on fuel, but the fuel tax would increase. That means we would see a jump of 8 to 9 cents a gallon at the pump. The plan will generate about $1.3 billion a year to fix Michigan's crumbling roads and bridges. And now it's up to voters to decide on May 5th if Proposal 1 is the best answer for getting the roads repaired. And that's where we begin our discussion with our My Week contributors. Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of the Detroit Free Press. Hey, guys. So, uh, yeah, when spring comes along, we know the potholes uh, open up and the roads are miserable around where I live. They're miserable 12 months of the year now. I mean, it's... We keep talking about pothole season. Pothole season lasts from January <laughs> to December. <laughs> I mean, the roads are a mess, and, and you know they're not they're not going to get any better. All right. So, but is the fact that things are really opening up now, Stephen, is this really going to encourage people to read what's in Proposal One and get them out on May fifth? You know, I, I'm not sure. I think I think it is a you know it's it's too complicated for people to sift through. I mean, I think these ballot proposals tend to be better when they are really simple questions. You know, one thing, yes or no. Uh, this is 10 things, yes or no. And you might be for some of them and not others. Uh, and you might not like the way that, that the road funding formula, uh, you know, looks on the back end of this thing. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm supporting it. We've, we came out in the free press over the weekend in, in support of it. Uh, but I, I am not optimistic that it's going to pass. I mean, I think that there are enough people who are confused or or just think it does too much uh, who are going to vote no. What is the most difficult thing to understand about this, Nolan? Or, well, I mean, or the top five difficult things to understand about this? I don't think it's all that difficult to understand. I think people understand it and they don't like it. I mean, I have never seen this level of hostility toward a battle, ballot proposal. I we We get letters all day long about this thing yeah, and almost the never get a letter saying before. I'm going to vote yes I mean I, I'd be shocked if this thing passed and you know the I, I think the most controversial piece of it is well I mean there's so much wrong with it but the most controversial piece of it is is you're talking about give us money for safe roads and yet 40 percent of the money raised won't go to roads it'll go to schools and other spending that people you know, may not be as feel as is urgent enough for a tax hike of this nature. And I think that's the problem with it. They larded it up with a whole lot of non-road spending, and that's got people, you know, it's got people angry. What are some of the things that people are pointing out in the in the notes? Well, I mean, there is school. You know, there's money that's going to schools. They're restoring the earned income tax credit, uh, and and these are things that are that are good policy. These are things that they should have done. Uh, during the legislative session last year anyway uh, we published a pretty extensive look at the proposal and all the ten different things that it, that it will do there's some stuff on there people would like some stuff that they wouldn't but but it's too much and I do think it is confusing people 
uh, about the way all of this happens. I mean, it's a it's a raise in the sales tax in exchange for a, a gradual reduction in in some fuel taxes. And I mean, it's 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 a lot. And you don't have a proponent out there saying, here's the simple reason to vote for this, other than the governor who's saying this is about safety. But I don't know that that is that that's selling the way he thinks it is. Well, they're starting to they're starting to run some ads too. That that's what the, the theme is that they're hammering. And you have people telling their stories about surviving. You know concrete being dropped from bridges on roads. Don't you think that that is the most powerful message, though, Nolan? I mean, it's the only message they've got. Um, I've th thought from beginning they don't need to convince people the roads are bad. People know the roads are bad. They've got to convince people that this is the only way to fix it. Um, there's no, nobody writes in and says, nah, the roads aren't that bad. We don't need to spend this money. Everybody understands we need to spend money. People believe there's money elsewhere that could be found, that they could make cuts in the budget and come up with this billion, billion and a half dollars. And they also just don't like the way this thing's structured. I think if they to put a straight gas tax hike on the ballot, let's raise the gas tax by 15 cents, particularly now when gas is a buck something cheaper than it was a year ago, that would have passed. The sales tax is a hard, a hard sell for anything. All right, but does this new legislature, should this not pass, are there ideas out there to try to come up with some alternate plan after May 5th, or are there plans to just start cutting from, from the budget they are, well, what we already I mean, have? Well, that's what the plan is. I mean, you have this this alternate road plan, quote unquote, that, that Jace Bolger floated last year, where by which you would uh, essentially, you know, uh, shift money around and, and take it from uh, schools and local governments to pay for roads that I think will get more traction in the legislature if uh, if this goes down um, and, and and that's not that's not helping us either now, and many of the pieces of that plan aren't even constitutional or they would have to go back to the, have to go back to the vote, ballot. voters which you know that's that's ridiculous that's, that's gonna be a process uh, well I, I like something that you wrote um, it was very interesting Nolan that if this does not pass that there should be a part-time legislature. I mean, these guys had a that job. This should, be the, this should be the plan B. Well, it should have been plan A from the beginning. Right? We don't need a full-time legislature up there if they can't get the job done. You know, this was a, a, a straightforward assignment, raise fine money for the roads, and they made as about as big a mess of it as they could. And now they're sitting here telling us, well, there's no plan B. The legis this legislature won't do anything. They won't find a fix. Well, then send them home. You know, most other states, 39 other states, have part-time legislature. Michigan had a part-time legislature until 1963. Um, make them part-time in term limits, and maybe we get some more courageous <laughs> lawmaking uh, going on up there. All right, so you mm. laugh. Is that a possibility that a part-time legislature well, could work well, here in Michigan? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm are for... You think, are you think Nolan's being a little hasty? No, well, I'm for a part-time legislature, and I'm for the end of term limits. Those are, th But those are good policy positions on their own. I don't think you tie them to the roads. That's not going to get the roads fixed. Hammer them what uh, people are angry. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, maybe we get it because people are mad at them and, and we end up in those positions. I think the, 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 the fear that I have is that uh, part-time legislature or not, we're not going to get a solution out of out of you know the environment in Lansing that makes sense to fix the roads uh, anytime soon, and, and that's the problem with with Prop One. All right, um, we have a couple more um, people who are coming out in support of Prop One, though. What do you think though needs to happen in the next four weeks? Is there anything huge that could sway this one way or the other? I mean, they've got to raise some money, a lot of money, and just pound the airwaves with, you know, this is good policy. This is this will fix your roads. You know. I, I think that's one option. The other option would be, and I think I don't have, have much hope of this happening, but if I were the governor and reading these tea leaves and taking a look at the sentiment against this proposal, I would, be, I would go to the legislature and say, give people an alternative. Um, say, just pass a straight 15 cent gas hike, tax hike that goes into effect if this, this fails. You think this legislature would do that? I mean, uh, there's no appetite for that up there. If they if they made it look like a choice, I you know, I know it's a problem, but do they really want this thing in their lap on May 6th? Well, you know, when in doubt, drown yourself in, uh, drown your sorrows in some ice cream. Ashby Sterling ice cream from out of <laughs> Shelby Township. Are we doing a has, commercial? No, they've made a new flavor called Michigan Pothole. Oh. It's chocolate in? with mm -hmm. with dark fudge and like Chocolate pieces. How chocolate about that? Stuff, yeah. oh. oh, so you didn't like my uh, pothole it's ice cream? It's more like pothole filler, right? That's right. That's like right. it's what Just you would put it. in a pothole. Just patch it. Yeah, I don't know. 
All right. <laughs> it went over real well. All right. Who doesn't want a raise or some more time off? Mm -hmm. Well, when you're Detroit City Council, those asks are going to come with some big time scrutiny. The council just passed a resolution to take almost a week off next month. Now, normally they use a spring break to work on the budget. But it's already been approved. The decision to take extra time off comes on the heels of a request by Council President Brenda Jones and City Clerk Janice Winfrey for an increase in pay. So far, the other council members have not openly discussed their views on a pay raise, and a final decision will be made by the city's Compensation Commission. They had uh, an open meeting this week, and people, a couple of people, it wasn't a very heavily attended meeting, uh, lined up to, to kind of give their opinion on this, and the, the overwhelming majority has been, I don't think they need a raise right now, Nolan. What do you think? Well, I mean, the timing of this was just ridiculous. Brenda Jones asked the commission to raise her salary, and the same week that cuts for retirees went into effect from the bankruptcy deal. I mean, it's, it's just insensitive and, and boneheaded. Um, I think that we should, the, the council should prove uh, that they deserve a raise before. I mean, they just got their powers back. We don't know whether it's going to be a good council or a bad council. I don't mind pay, paying politicians a decent wage, what they're worth. I'm not, you know, one of those folks who say, oh, you know, strip their pay or, or whatever. But let's see how well they do. And Let's wait until uh, the city's able to restore some of the cuts to other employees before they take theirs first. Yeah, how do you measure, though, how well they're doing? What would the bar be for you? Well, I mean, if they play a constructive role in this um, ongoing recovery and management of the city out of bankruptcy, if they, if they take common sense votes instead of digging their heels in on things that need to be done, we don't know what kind of council this is going to be yet. And, you know, but apart from that, a lot of people took concessions for the city. A lot of people made sacrifices. As they're restored, maybe that would be time to restore the cuts the council took, but they shouldn't be first in line. What do you think? Well, I mean, you heard the testimony during the compensation uh, commission's uh, testimony d this week uh, about their pay. They are underpaid, uh, but but most people who work for the city of Detroit mm -hmm. are underpaid, and I think that's the the issue. The, the context here is missing. Uh, if you're going to restore council pay, which was cut as part of a budget cutting uh, process that also cut the mayor's pay and and some other people's, then I think you have to look at and the overall pay for people in the city. And you start at the bottom. You started with the lowest paid. Uh, workers who who are working for less than they than they used to, and now don't have uh, the kind of pensions that that uh, they used to offer people. Um, I, I I don't think they're wrong substantively. Does this uh, look bad? But but the, it's, you're right. It's the timing. Yeah, it looks horrible. You you have the the council president saying I need more money at a time like Nolan said when when retirees are taking hits, when the lowest paid workers in the city uh, are, are still are still at the at the low end of You of got the one of them scale. sitting in jail right now. I well, mean, one of the I council wonder, members, right? You got a, well, a councilman sitting in jail yeah. over in Macomb County. I wonder if he's getting his pay this week, you know, while he's doing his drunk driving. You got another one who, you know, could go to jail at any minute. You never know with Cushenberry. I mean, is this really? Well, that's. Are, are we really making a case? I think, I, I that actually these think. folks are worth. I actually think the council's been doing uh, okay. I mean, since uh, we had the new mayor and the new council, uh, they've worked very well together uh, under the bankruptcy to get things done that needed to be done to get us through that. Uh, I, I feel like they've been working pretty well together now. I, I, my problem is not with performance. My problem is with, uh, again, the context. If you're going to raise their pay, who else should get a pay raise and who should be in line in front of that? What about uh, what about this time off, this week time off that they usually take around spring break to look at the budget? The budget's already done. They still want the time off. Is this just a big deal about nothing? It probably. I mean, what are they, what are they going to do if they go in for a week, I mean, you, sometimes they can do more damage being there than say if they're not there, there, they can't pass. I, mean, I don't crazy know. Stuff. If they don't need to be sitting perhaps in city hall for that week. It might be useful if they were out in their communities trying to figure out what problems they could solve. I don't, you know, I, I don't know what their schedule is. I'm sure they get plenty of time off. They probably shouldn't be voting extra time off, but they don't necessarily need to be at the council table. They could be out in their districts figuring things out. All right, well, that commission is supposed to make a decision about pay raises <clears throat> uh, by the end of the month. Turning now to the state, this week the Board of Education selected Brian Whiston as the next state superintendent. He will step in this summer after current schools chief Mike Flanagan retires. Whiston is currently the superintendent of Dearborn Public Schools. He takes over at a time when education in Michigan is going through a lot of changes, and I think that's an understatement. This was an interesting process, though, Nolan, to watch uh, as, it played out, uh, as it played out in the Capitol. What was your take on it when 
you saw it all come down? Well, it confirmed to me that um, we really don't need an elected school board, and that should be the next ballot measure um, Michigan faces. Uh, most other states don't have a elected school board that operates independently of the governor. The governor should be responsible and accountable for education policy. Uh, this school board has is has always been controlled by the unions. It's absolutely useless. They got they had three candidates, two of them anti-reform, anti-school choice, and of course they picked a, a guy who you know hasn't been friendly to school choice. That's completely runs counter to the direction the state's going in and the governor's going in, and he's going you know he's going to keep stripping their powers away because he's not going to allow this obstructionist board to get in the way. They picked a guy who got in all sorts of trouble or was part of this scandal out in Oakland County several years ago. You all wrote a, a series about it with the expense account abuse uh, at the Oakland Intermediate School District. I mean, he's a lobbyist. And it, it was absolutely a, a choice aimed at sticking a thumb in the eye of the governor, you know. He's also had a lot of support, or Brian Whiston has uh, in uh, Dearborn, where he has been superintendent for uh, the last couple of years and getting test scores up. Um, he's also been very vocal in um, the fact that the school funding has been cut, uh, you know, for the last couple of years, and he's had to do a lot more with a lot less in Dearborn. And he's also had to deal with a growing population of students where English is not their first language, and he has been fairly successful in that district. Would you give him? Uh, would you give him a little support for that, Stephen? I, I don't think he's been a bad superintendent in in, in Dearborn, and or at least I haven't seen anything that suggests he has. I think the, the choice here, though, is, is wrapped up in this power struggle between the board and the governor, and that's the problem. Uh, and, and the governor's as much at fault at this point as the board is. I mean, uh, just because you don't like what the board does or how it's made up, which, you know, is, is determined by voters, doesn't really give you the right to say, well, I'm going to cut you out of the decision making that the Constitution gives you. Uh, I mean, that's a... It's that's an a, Obama move. It's a, <laughs> I know you said. You keep saying that. Uh, you know, it's a power. It's a power grab that I don't think uh, is is warranted, and is also not supported by the governor's record. Uh, the governor's record on on education, on moving failing schools to to better status, is not really great. And in fact, in Detroit, it's awful. Uh, and so, what what reason should we have to think that the school board is any less? Uh, prepared to do that than than Governor Snyder. They had a good good um, candidate, this Menzel out of Washington County would have been um, the 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 board made him one of their top three candidates. The governor liked him. Would have been a, a selection that could have started to to patch these these hard feelings up and and move everybody to a a better place here. And you know instead they just. You know, they went. Well, they went with an obstruction. They tried to pick somebody who would uh, antagonize right. uh, uh, the governor, and I'm not sure that's the best reason to pick somebody. At the same time, this guy is not, um, you know, he's not he's not the the, the anti uh, reform, uh, you know, devil that I think people are going to. Did it surprise you guys that um, no one from out of state? Was in the in the final that someone from well, some was. other part of the country, one. but in the in the final three though. No, there should have been. There was the guy from Massachusetts where they've done amazing things with mm -hmm. schools. Um, highly sought after guy. He I, he, you know, passed on an, an opportunity to take another job because he wanted this one. He made the final six, and then as soon as the governor uh, made his move with the reform office, you know, out of spite, the board dropped him from the contention. He was probably the best guy in the field. It is. It's not. A good way to make decisions. Okay. It's not serving the people. But you're talking about about how decisions were made out of spite, and it's political, and it's what the board thinks versus how the governor wants to run things. And I feel that we have this growing storm of education in Michigan, and, and what needs to happen here in the state in the next two years. And your parents sitting at home and wondering, you know, what standards my kid is going to be measured upon, and, and and what do we need to do in this state to make sure that our schools and our kids are achieving at higher levels than they have been in the last ten years. So you're the new superintendent and you're walking into this, what can people expect now and what is his role going to be and what can parents expect from this? Well, for a while we've had this this sort of yin and yang. Uh, uh, Flanagan, Mike Flanagan, who's the superintendent now, hadn't agreed with a lot of the things that, yeah. that, that Governor Steiner wanted to do and, and has tried at various times. But they times work fairly to, well together. Uh, they work better together than, than I think this pair will, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the new superintendent and, and, and the governor. And, you know, that's the system we have. And I, I agree with Nolan that, that uh, maybe it's time to revisit it. Uh, you know, most states don't have an elected uh, statewide school board, uh, but they do try to insulate 
uh, the Department of Education somehow from politics by by limiting the the appointive ability of the governor or uh, using a commission or something like that. Uh, right now, the system that we have sets up these two really powerful, independently elected uh, forces that that historically have not done that great in getting along and getting stuff done in Michigan. It's one of the reasons other states make are making progress at much faster rate. There's no secret for what needs to happen in education. You just need to look to places like Massachusetts and Florida and even Tennessee where results are are growing at a, a much faster rate than in Michigan when we sit here and fight um, about control and well, governance and, and turf. Yeah, and one of the things that we've got to get past is, you know, this antagonism about unions. I mean, teachers are part of unions, and but they're also the ones who have to put reform into effect. If you beat them up uh, in the reform process, I don't know why you expect that they're going to, 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 to do these things in, in a better way. But they can't, on the, on the other side, they can't sit there and dig their heels in and, and fight every change. Which I don't is feel what, like they're doing Which that. is what the unions have done in this state for a long time. They've seen every change as a, as a threat to their franchise. But, but we also have seen, we, we have more charter schools than anybody else. Uh, we have more choice than most other states. I mean, the unions haven't been in the way of any of those things. I think their, their, their objection is these things haven't improved uh, the outcomes the way that they were promised The to. positions and of the unions in the state have been, hey, just give us more money and stay out of our way. Don't hold us accountable. They deserve Don't more ask money. For, ask us. I would agree if they produce results, but we haven't seen the results here. And they've fought every single But choice reform. hasn't re produced results, and been, so who's, who, who's making money off of that? They, they fought more than choice. I mean, they, 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 they fought the seniority changes, the tenure changes. Uh, they fought um, classroom accountability. They have fought everything that p other states are doing and things that are working. All right, well, we're gonna have to leave it there. But finally tonight, memo to Madonna, you are wrong about Rochester Hills. City Mayor Brian Barnett fired off an open letter this week to the singer defending his city. Seems that Madge described the residents of her hometown, Rochester Hills, as, quote, basic and provincial thinking. She made the comment on the Howard Stern radio show to explain why she didn't go back home after being attacked in New York when she started her career. In his letter, the mayor touted all the things that make Rochester Hills a great city. So what do you think in this in this grudge match, Nolan? That were the apples Mayor Barnett are. versus <laughs> Madonna. That's where the apples are up in Rochester. No, that's Romeo, I, right? I, you know, oh, there's I apples it, also in Rochester. I think it might be kind of interesting to have Madonna in Rochester just hanging out. And, uh, <laughs> I've never been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just see, see, Madonna just still trying to be relevant, taking well, some shots against your hometown. Though. That's okay. You know, I mean, uh, she didn't like growing up there, and so as she said, so she said, I wouldn't have dignified the the insult with a response. I mean, what, what's the point of saying, well, no, no, this is a cool place. Actually, if you go up there, I mean, what's there? It's a, it's, <gasps> a, it's a suburb. I mean, it's just, it's it, like all the other and suburbs. And everyone from Northern Rochester Northern Hills, County. I'm sorry, Stephen, what's your email address <laughs> that we should be emailing I mean, you? you? Know, it, is I, a, it is a lovely <laughs> area, and it's not a bunch of, you know, country bumpkins is what I think uh -huh. Madonna was uh, insinuating. Yeah. In She's her. hanging out in Ann Arbor now anyway, because that's where her daughter. Oh, is, that the, is the cool factor spiked a little higher now because she's the there? University, so you, she's lots of Madonna side at coffee shops and things. Really? So, yeah. I think, Her she likes, there. I think she likes Ann Arbor a lot more. Well, <laughs> well, she could come home anytime, so says uh, Mayor Barnett. And so you're going to go see her show in October? She's coming. <laughs> <laughs> no one will be front row. I'm going to put on my pointy bra and be sitting right in front row. <laughs> and that's going to do it for my week. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to continue our conversation online right after the show. Go to myweek.org for an extra segment you won't see on TV. We're also on Facebook and Twitter during the week. Make sure you connect with us there. I'm Christy McDonald. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, we will see you next week. Take care. <laughs>